host uh, for a conversation today, uh, the first in our series with Nicole Turner, whom we'll introduce in just a second. <clears throat> this is the first of a series of four conversations and possibly uh, you know, growing lists of conversations that we'll be hosting uh, during this time in order to help continue conversations and discussions about new work in the Civil War era broadly defined, uh, new directions in the field, and also the relationship of the field to ongoing debates in public history. And it's aimed for both an academic and a general audience. And we're delighted that our attendees today include both academics and, and members of a general audience. The next three talks you can find um, listed on our website at the Journal of the Civil War Era dot um, org backslash muster, or you can Google Journal of the Civil War Era and click the button for muster, which is our online presence. And they are all take place at this time of day, 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. Um, the next one is Wednesday, August 5th with Dr. Tira Hunter on emancipation during the Civil War. Following that, Thursday, August 13th with Dr. Stephanie McCurry on the Confederate States of America. And the following one on Wednesday, August 19th with Dr. Thomas Brown on Civil War monuments and the militarization of America. There's a lot to be said about the topics of each uh, of these talks and there's larger descriptions at the muster site. And I see a question uh, about whether we can put um, make sure to put available the link to that, um, you know, which I, which I believe that we'll be able to do. A couple of general uh, broadcast, uh, you know, things to tell you before we go into this. Uh, the first is the format that uh, in just a moment, uh, Kate will introduce uh, Nicole Turner and uh, start a series of questions that we imagine uh, from us that we imagine will take uh, roughly 30, 35, 40 minutes in that ballpark. During this time, we'll be able to see questions that you are submitting from your Q and on the uh, Q&A button. Um, those will come to us. We also have some pre-submitted questions and we'll be drawing upon those uh, to utilize to ask questions of Nicole. Uh, we don't intend to, uh, to uh, attach the questions to individuals, so you can submit it without any uh, concern uh, about that. And we may modify them slightly, you know, for length or clarity or to combine questions that are out there. Additionally, I want to remind, let you know that we, we will be recorded. No one will appear on screen other than the three of us. Um, but the contents of this will be recorded. And then after some very slight editing, they will be moved uh, to the Journal of the Civil War um, website where we'll start accumulating these videos so they can be watched asynchronously. So we really do appreciate all of you coming. Uh, we had an earlier one with a uh, discussion of the journal that was widely attended and a lot of enthusiasm there for engagement in these kind of talks in a time when conferences, including the Society of the Civil War Historians and others aren't able to meet in person. And we're delighted to have you here and we're delighted to have our guests, especially our first, uh, first guest in this series. So to move to that, I'll turn over to Kate. All right, well, thanks, Greg, and welcome everyone to the first uh, in this lecture series or webinar series. It's my pleasure to introduce Nicole Myers Turner and her book. Nicole Turner is Assistant Professor of Religious Studies at Yale University. She earned her PhD in history at the University of Pennsylvania, her Master's in Divinity at Union Theological Seminary in New York, and her Bachelor's Degree in Political Science from Haverford College. And she's the author of this 2020 book, Soul Liberty, The Evolution of Black Religious Politics in Post-Emancipation Virginia, published this year, 2020, by University of North Carolina Press. And uh, before uh, asking Nicole uh, the first question, I just want to mention that this book is both appears in this kind of conventional version of a hard copy, but also has two other versions. And part of what makes her work so interesting is that it's so engaged with digital humanities. So the book also exists as a conventional or sort of conventional, as she describes it, verbatim open access ebook and also as an enhanced open access ebook, which has 
which shows off what uh, Dr. Turner was able to do with mapping um, and kind of digital technology in order to develop her, her research findings. And so one of the things I hope we'll get to talk about today is how she worked with those sources and what kinds of promise she thinks digital humanities holds for this kind of research into African-American history in particular. So um, just to get us started off, Dr. Turner, tell us a little bit about um, tell us about this book. How do you describe this book to people who don't know anything about it? What are its main arguments? What does it accomplish? And how um, do you see it kind of contributing to the general conversation? Well, that was a lot of questions. Let's just start with, uh, was, give us your, your general kind of uh, pitch about this book and, and what its central claims are. So this book, thank, at first I want to say thank you so much for having me as part of the series um, and as uh, part of a wonderful series of other scholars who will be here, but I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about my work. Um, and the book, uh, Soul Liberty, is about the evolution of Black religious politics. And the main goal of the book is to historicize how Black churches became political agents. I mean, I think that there's a very common understanding of Black churches as always already politically engaged. And um, my the aim of my work was to kind of narrate that process, that it wasn't always engaged in the same ways, um, and that Black churches are, in fact, historical spaces uh, that have changed across time and were changed in the process of reconstruction. And so that's what the main aim of the book is. Thank you so much. Um, we'll be bouncing back and forth, uh, so I don't mean to catch you from two different, uh, two different sides. I'm really <laughs> delighted to, uh, to read the book and really exciting, and I have about nine million questions, so I'm gonna ask them all at once, talk really fast. No, I'm kidding. Uh, so I'm gonna uh, try and, and, and apportion them out and be patient for, uh, for all the things that, uh, that I wanna ask later. Um, building off of what you just said, I wonder if you can help us understand, um, what do you mean by soul liberty? Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's not just a lovely title, but it's also a concept you return to over the book and that seems to speak to some of these intersections that you're so interested in, in religion and politics and how they're shaping each other. So uh, I wonder if you could just sort of get us started on what that, what that means uh, in your work. Sure, thank you. Um, so soul liberty actually comes from a quote in the Virginia Baptist State Convention minutes where the uh, members of the convention were citing Roger Williams' pursuit of soul liberty in the formation of Rhode Island. Um, but what's interesting about the usage of that term was that it's not only a term that applied to the Black Baptists who were part of the study, but it also applied to Black Episcopalians and Black members of the uh, Zion Union Apostolic Church, which is a, was a holiness sect that started in uh, Southern Virginia and North Carolina. Um, but the term soul liberty refers to this idea of religious freedom, Right? this idea that Black people could worship when, where, and with whom they chose. Uh, and it also points to this idea of equity and justice and righteousness that they were also pursuing in their religious communities, but also in the broader public landscape. Um, and so while the term and it originally comes from a very particular Baptist context is something that applies to, you know, the Black Baptist and the Virginia Baptist State Convention, the Black Episcopalians who um, who attended uh, the Branch Theological School, which was the first Black seminary for uh, Black ministers and uh, priests in the Episcopal tradition, uh, and to members of the Zion Union Apostolic Church, uh, one of the few sort of original Black denominations um, that was started in the South, the only one, one of the only ones that was started in the South. Um, they all are pursuing this idea of being able to worship as they saw fit, uh, and, and also these ideas of freedom, equity, and justice. So the, your answer captures, I think, uh, many of the really fascinating aspects of it, one of which that uh, particularly struck me and that you note in, in, in your own, uh, in the text and in your own notes, um, is that that pursuit of liberty uh, is, uh, you know, at first glance might read as uh, liberty to worship uh, separate from white interference, which is certainly an, an important part of the story, but also a liberty that allows for quite different types of formation in the freed people's religious world. And I was interested in the, you know, you write about the ways that for understandable reasons, Baptist and the AME church sits so centrally in the, in the literature, which is, you know, makes perfect sense. Um, 
And yet other religious experiences, the Episcopalians whom you mentioned, or the African-American members of the MEC, you know, developing later and others, um, seem to be harder to, to pin down in the, in the literature. And what is it you think we gain when we study people who choose, as in St. Stephen's, um, to operate in what seems to be a, a almost completely African-American space, but to remain within a white dominated, white dominated denomination. Um, what is it that we, as a historian, what drew you to, to those spaces as well? So I hear in your question a couple of things. One has to do with this definition of liberty. One has to do with the sort of differences in the denominations and their approaches. And I would say first that this comes, the ability to see this landscape comes from doing a sort of a, a geographical look, right? A study that begins in a particular place in Virginia and uh, sort of not taking the lens of a particular denomination. So I didn't come to it, you know, only through the lens of Baptist, but also looking at the landscape of Virginia, which yielded up both, you know, all three of those different uh, denominations. And um, when you start to think about how each of these um, religious communities chose to pursue freedom, um, you know, it becomes really evident uh, that for the Baptists, part of the trajectory of their struggle goes through, um, you know, sort of the beginnings where Black Baptists are organized already in conventions before uh, the vote is, is, uh, is, is established by the 15th Amendment but they're already making arguments for their political participation and for their skill. It's something that was extant even before emancipation, right? There were black people organizing associations and so they have um, sort of demonstrated the skill and the ability to participate as citizens um, through their own religious communities. Um, but then you find, you know, a very interesting, you know, story of St. Stephen's Episcopal Church in Petersburg, Virginia, which is started by a Black woman uh, who, in consultation with the uh, white priest from the church that her family became members of, establishes uh, an independent Black church, one of the first Black Episcopal churches uh, for, uh, for the community in Petersburg. And it's an interesting story because I think a lot of people tend to associate the Episcopal church with sort of high church culture, not with sort of roots in an enslaved or a formerly enslaved or free Black community. Uh, they certainly don't tend to associate Episcopal churches with Black women's leadership. Um, and in this instance, you have Black people like uh, Caroline Bragg, who helped establish the church, and her grandson, George Friedman Bragg, who becomes involved in the readjuster movement, another thing that sort of drew me to the Virginia landscape. Um, and George Bragg, you know, becomes involved in the readjuster movement, becomes a sort of critical agent in, um, in narrating Black history, um, and reflects how the struggle for Black freedom took place in many spaces, whether it was Black Baptists who were establishing their own independent spaces and churches and associations, or if it was Black Episcopalians who were constantly sort of navigating the landscape of engaging with former Confederates, as George Bragg did as a student at the Branch Theological School, uh, as participant in the Readjuster Movement, uh, it really opens up a way of thinking through how did Black people go about forming this type of alliance? I mean, that was one of the things that actually drew me to uh, this particular case of Virginia, is how did they form this alliance? Um, and so I think one of the things that becomes evident is the struggle is real in all these spaces, right? That Black people are struggling for a sense of freedom and finding ways to achieve it in these various locations. Thanks so much, Nicole. I, I wanted to, um, this is so interesting. Now the, the majority, the vast majority of your book takes us into the post-Civil War period. I mean, you're really talking and, you know, as the title suggests about this post-emancipation moment. But I wanted to just have you talk a little bit about that transition from slavery to freedom. You're talking about an area um, in Virginia where the vast majority of African Americans before the Civil War were enslaved, although there were some free Black people as well. And mm -hmm. how would you describe for, for us, for readers, um, what that transition looked like? What were the aspects of Black religious experiences during the time of slavery um, that informed what people did after emancipation? Uh, what were the particular challenges that people faced as um, slavery came to an end during the Civil War and afterwards? And how, did, did, how do you understand and see that transition? Thank you. And so I think the, the transition can be seen best um, by thinking in part about sort of the longstanding narratives of Black 
church engagement um, and sort of thinking about how it is that in the antebellum period there were um, independent black churches where black people were able to worship um, in independent churches um, and they were able to sort of develop leadership skills. But one of the things that we start to see happening in the post-emancipation landscape is uh, our debates about land ownership and property, right? And so there's this uh, really interesting aspect of thinking about Black land ownership as something that came first through churches, right? And that Black people were starting to navigate the legal systems through trying to secure ownership, uh, like by title and sort of formal ownership of churches that they had actually paid into uh, help support and develop economically, but didn't have the right to sort of full name ownership, like on the deed kind of situation. So some, part of that transition involves a transition to property ownership. Um, part of what you see transforming in, the, in this uh, post-emancipation period has to do a little bit with gender roles. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to sort of highlight in this moment is how gender roles were being established in church communities. Uh, and so part of what you can see or what, what I try to uh, convey through telling the story of um, Gilfield Baptist Church in Petersburg and looking very closely at the landscape of uh, the discipline meetings in the churches was how gender roles were actually being transformed in, the, in that moment. Um, and so one of the, the things I focus on in looking at um, the cases of uh, unwed pregnancy, which you know, the discipline meetings handled a lot of different kinds of issues, um, but I focus in on the cases of unwed pregnancy because there's um, <clears throat> a clear sort of transformation in how um, the community initially didn't, you know, uh, hold both parties accountable for a woman being pregnant out of wedlock. For a brief moment in time, they do allow for both parties to be held accountable. Um, and then um, and then they shift back to going back to just women being held accountable. And, and part of what happens as a result is that women sort of move back into the space of only being disciplined in the church meetings. Um, and in this moment, you also start to see the rise of a centralized ministerial figure um, who's male and who has a particular sort of gendered status. So I think there are ways in which the leadership roles change and expand. Um, how uh, access to land and property is something that changes um, through the churches across this time, and also how gender roles are being transformed uh, on the landscape of uh, religious institutions. And just to follow up on that question about gender really and gender roles, I, I feel like, and you make reference to the work, late, work on a later period of, um, for instance, Glenda Gilmore, and to some extent, the historian Elsa Barkley Brown, um, about kind of an argument that either um, gender roles among African Americans, particularly in churches, became more kind of conventional, what we now understand to be conventional, you know, ideas about male leadership and female women kind of being part of the church, but not being in leadership roles or um, conventional ideas about gendered respectability, that that emerged later, like in the 1890s or so. And I'm just wondering, you know, are you, do you see that what you're finding as suggesting that um, all of the things that people said came about later actually happened earlier? Um, and also, I think that raises a question which is interesting and kind of repeated a lot of different places that uh, p historians have suggested that the immediate post-emancipation period, um, emancipation period was a period of kind of greater experimentation around gender hierarchy among African Americans kind of just coming out of slavery, that there was more fluidity and more contestation um, that, you know, because of, because, for example, so many families and so many marriages have been interrupted by the domestic slave trade. And now you have this kind of moment of more uh, flexibility. Are you, are you finding something really different from that here? Yeah, and I think, yes, I think the short answer is yes, that I think it, when you look at the Petersburg landscape, you definitely see the imposition of gender roles taking place much earlier. But I think the question is not necessarily only one of time period, but it's also a place, it's also a circumstance, it's also a you know, particular leadership model. Um, and, you know, you know, one of the things I've talked about in the study and, and, and acknowledge is that this is a look, a deep look at a particular community. And we need many more studies and many more locations in order to get a much broader picture of these transformations and how they 
emerge. But yes, I definitely think that in this particular case, it's a challenge to, you know, sort of thinking about how gender roles actually could be transformed much earlier. And um, in this particular instance, finding this, this cache of church records that really revealed what was taking place on the ground in this community was very instructive that, you know, people were having very different experiences of how gender was being transformed um, during that time. The, one of the places that we see that is in uh, the conventions and conferences and these other organizational and networking levels. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, we'll come back to this uh, in a little bit when we turn to mapping, but staying on, on, on the level of uh, more your argument. Um, I want to say first, I think one of the joys in reading this book and in reading, you know, other books of history that uh, have this deep granularity is seeing a historian take something um, that on its face, you know, a lot of historians rush past because it doesn't seem that interesting, right? Like people get why congregations are interesting. Mm -hmm. But conferences and conventions, you know, this seems, you know, there's a lot of like, you know, who's representing. Um, <laughs> And to explain why not only that's meaningful, you know, which was meaningful to them, but also interesting. And I do think it's a real magical, one of the magical moments of, of the book to see you take this thing that it's, you know, we would all I feel the impulse to kind of be like, how do I get to the good stuff and say, this actually is the good stuff if we see it right. Mm -hmm. Or this networking and connection. And also though, as you say, for the ways it ties back to your question about uh, about gender, about the ways that these spaces become uh, not exclusively, but, but spaces of a male ministerial privilege. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you would just tell people, uh, you know, who, who you haven't yet read it, um, you know, what you draw from, what you learn from those areas, why you think those spaces matter. Um, and if you're, you know, if you've got uh, space, you know, what, what, what drew you to it? Did you know all along that that was going to be a real telling part or did it develop over the course of your study? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I, you know, it's so funny because um, I, I do remember people sort of cautioning me about a couple of things. One being that there would not be a lot of information about churches and the records were not so deep and that those convention minutes would be really boring and, and there's not a lot in them. But I will say that you know, I was encouraged by El uh, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham when she actually reproduced the schedule of the convention in Righteous Discontent. I was like, wow, that was really instructive about what was something I had no real insight into uh, absent having read the book. So I knew that there was something you could do with those minutes beyond be bored by them. Um, but also, you know, I, I, the, uh, uh, um, the Baptist convention minutes um, are a treasure trove of information about black religious and political life preserved on microfilm. Um, some of them have whole 30 year runs of their convention minutes. So the Virginia Baptist State Convention, nearly every year you can find an annual convention record. So, I mean, it's, it's robust. Um, and I only looked at one segment of the state. I mean, these exist for every state almost. So it's a huge archive, if you think about it, of you know black religious life that needs to be mined. And so, you know, as I sort of got into them, I was like, wow, there's actually a lot here to see, right? Um, but, and it also came out of an investment in using the archive of Black people's lives, right? So, you know, in recognition that the archives of Black religious life uh, in many instances can be um, small, can be mediated often through the eyes of white people, um, that this is an archive that comes from black people about their experience. And so it's really important for me to center those sources and to, you know, use every bit. It's like I remember in graduate school, one of my uh, instructors talking about, you know, being, being told that when you find something, you know, about black people's lives, you have to figure out how you can use it and use it in the most robust way possible. And so it was really important for me to read those sources and get everything that I could from them. And you cannot help but be struck by what is included in them. I mean, the names of all of the delegates who attended, the names and locations of all the churches that are there. I mean, you know, the different issues that they're discussing and recording in their minutes, um, their financial records. I mean, it, they're rich, they're incredibly rich. So it was like, you know, I saw so much more in them and it was so important to use. And then, you know, as I'm reading through them, I'm noticing, you know, <clears throat> though there are no women sort of uh, initially on the boards of these conventions, but they show up, right? They show up in 
these accounts where they're acknowledged for their donation to the convention, you know, donation, donation of a golden coin. And then you see it happen again. And you see it happen again. It's like, huh, you know, like what, what's going on here that women are showing up this very particular way. And to me, it started to speak to how it is that women become the sort of central financial figures. It's one of the first ways that we see them in the conventions is as donors, as people who are financially demonstrating um, the sacrificial giving that, you know, so many of these conventions rely on. So, you know, it's like one of these narratives that's sort of already running in my head about the role of Black women in churches as financial people, and I'm seeing it being constructed in real time in the conventions as these women are being recognized for their giving. Um, and it also, of course, raises a question about, you know, sort of how is Black manhood being constructed in and through these spaces and in and through churches and all those kinds of things, which is the other aspect of the story that I wanted to um, tell, right? I mean, I think, you know, we've had great works that sort of point to the ways that women played a role in the construction of Black Baptist conventions and Blackness and um, social activism and all these things. But to kind of take a step back and think about, well, how is Black manhood being constructed in these spaces was also something I thought was worth kind of trying to unearth, that that's also a construction that's happening in these spaces. And so um, was able to get at that through some of the convention minutes, but also through the church records, that there is something else taking place here too. Um, thank you so much. That's a really good segue into um, a question that I wanted to kind of follow up on. Uh, I think part, one of the central claims, as you said at the beginning of your book is, uh, at the beginning of the talk is, um, has to do with the relationship between Black church organizing and politics in the formal politics sense, in kind of the sense of voting, party politics, electoral politics. And so um, you talking about being interested in investigating what you can tell about the construction of Black manhood through these church records kind of leads neatly into this question about the relationship between those developments within churches and what's going on in formal politics, where in 1867, African-American men are enfranchised for the first time and begin to vote. Um, Black people begin to play a totally uh, different and more important role in party politics, you know, becoming Republicans, eventually becoming readjusters. And so what is your, how do you explain um, the impact of kind of the entry of African American men in particular into the formal politics of voting and, and being part of party politics, the relationship between that and developments within churches? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think, um, so a couple of things. One has to do with, you know, what I think was sort of playing out in the background in Guilfield, um, where, you know, the, the church is dealing with these issues of unwed pregnancy at the same at the same time almost that, you know, black men are first getting the right to vote at the same time that the minister of the church is actually running for office um, and other members of the church are running for office or holding office. So these things are happening concurrently. And while I can't say that, you know, it was a definite one-to-one -one that the, the church made the set of decisions it did about women's uh, participation uh, because of that political landscape. It's definitely part of the consideration. And I sort of, I arrive at that assessment, or I think it's part of the, uh, part of the assessment because so as you look at the long trajectory of how the people in that church thought about themselves um, and their role in society and how they were being viewed, I think it has implications for, um, the, the, it suggests that they were thinking about, you know, how is this church going to be perceived? How are members being perceived as Black men are gaining the right to vote and holding office? Um, but the other thing that I think happens uh, in terms of shaping and influencing uh, political engagement has to do with uh, both the ways that Black people were organizing in their conventions and ways they understood themselves as already politically savvy and politically skilled. I mean, you think about their conventions where, you know, they had already been holding, you know, presidential elections and having committees and um, doing all the work of political participation. So to suggest that they should somehow not be allowed to hold office at the highest levels, um, you know, would, would rankle with anybody, right? But for these people in particular who'd already been doing it for themselves and then, then be told that you can't sort of advance to, you know, outside of the sort of box that, you know, the readjusters wanted them to be in initially was a challenge. And I think that's part of the way that they were sort of influenced to political action uh, is because they already had the skills. But I also think that the associations and the ways that they helped to form um, community across county lines, um, across the lines of cities, the ways they brought people into um, contact with one another, um, formed a foundation for people to think about themselves as a collective, as a collective with 
political power, with the power to influence uh, political outcomes. And, you know, so I, I was initially um, sort of brought into thinking about Virginia um, because of the readjuster movement. And, you know, so I've been told when I sort of settled on Virginia as a place that I wanted to study uh, this question of religion and power and reconstruction, uh, I was told well, you have to look at the Mahone papers, right? The Mahone papers are this like amazing, you know, huge collection of records. But what, but what I was directed to was the uh, Mahone record where he actually did a, um, a canvas of black churches. And so it's really an invitation to think about the role of black churches in this movement. And, you know, so it, it's really interesting to me, right? That Mahone is like, let me sort of figure out where these churches are and kind of who they are, you know, how he might be able to mobilize them for his own political ends. But what I discovered is that, well, he's kind of late to the game. The black churches already have these records. They already have a list of their people. They already know who they are and where they are and how many they are. They already have this sense of their political landscape. And so, you know, on the one hand, Mahone, you know, he acknowledges that by trying to gather this information, but these churches already know. They already know who their people are. Um, and so that's the other piece of how black churches become these political agents is it's forming a consciousness of gathering of political power through these networks. That's great. <clears throat> I, I think um, for the sake of, uh, of any of our audience members who don't, uh, have the readjuster movement down pat. How about if we ask you just to, because it's one of the, you know, as I said with conventions, there's a series of moments in the book um, where we really get these uh, magnificent um, takes on really important and often separated in the literature moments. And, and, a, and a key aspect of that is that you begin um, in slavery and you go deep into the, the late 19th century and, in, and, and really with a lot to say about this uh, incredibly volatile and interesting period in Virginia politics. So do you mind first giving, you know, just an overview and then I'll do a follow up on, you know, what you so what, you know, the many things that your book has to say about how we can turn and, and better understand or understand that, that moment differently. Mm -hmm, sure. uh, but on a sort of what happened level that takes, uh, helps us understand Mahone and then the eventual uh, John Mercer Langston, uh, you know, intervention. Sure. So the readjuster movement uh, was basically, I, I talk about it like it was Virginia's reconstruction, right? You know, it was the moment where um, a biracial coalition of black and white voters and politicians um, were able to gain control of the state legislature and ultimately of the state patronage um, to affect the changes um, of um, allowing black people to sit on juries, um, of establishing schools um, for black people like Virginia State University. They actually carry out the work of ending the whipping post. Um, and it's a movement that um, threatened to destroy the South South because of this coalition of black and white uh, former conservatives um, who, uh, uh, who threatened the South South. Um, and uh, it's you know often told the story of William Mahone, who was a former Confederate general who um, is able to sort of mobilize these coalitions of black and white voters. Um, and you know, because of his voluminous archive, he often sits at the center of the story. But uh, it's a coalition that's built initially at this legislative level of having black uh, state ele state elected officials who voted in conjunction with the readjusters to um, basically they united over this argument about readjusting the state debt. Um, and I remember when I initially started to study this, I was like, this is such an arcane set of municipal finance politics that how is it possible to build a coalition around these things uh, in this particular moment, but they organize over readjusting the state debt in part because, you know, the state is decimated after, after the Civil War, financially decimated. And there was a recognition that on the part of white, you know, white farmers and white folks that this was a, a detriment to the state's advancement, but also for black folks who uh, former formerly enslaved people who didn't contribute to the state that were now going to be sort of responsible for you know taking care of it and while the debt was being tended to um things like paying for education were not right so the readjusters tried to reorient reorient the state to a, a context where people were you know trying to reorganize how the state was going to apportion its funds um so that's the readjuster movement kind of yeah in a nutshell that's great in a nutshell the um, and one of the great turns that you make is by connects to something that we got questions on and uh, that I'm sure people will want to expand upon, uh, which is what you gained by mapping. 
In other words, how mapping didn't just let you show other people what you knew, but it became a tool for you to discover things that you might, you had collected the information, um, but it was really as, as you started to pull into maps, you narrate how you, you start to see some of the connections. And especially in the relationship, the ways that your portrayal of the Mahone movement shifts through your understanding of the organization of the Baptist churches. And I wonder mm -hmm. if you can talk to us a little bit about how that interacts both as a sort of an argument, but also how your argument emerged from this, uh, you know, expertise in digital humanities and mapping. Mm -hmm. Sure. And so, you know, it, it was interesting because I think um, there are two arguments. One has to do with the politics and the political landscape, and there's one that has to do with mapping and maps. Um, but I came to mapping because not only is sort of looking at the church records and sort of finding these lists of churches, um, but also in the Mahone records and in that particular um, canvas that he did, sort of finding myself wanting to see visually where these people were, right? What was the landscape of the network that he uncovered? Um, and then when I was able to sort of map and, and, and the, the, what the sort of GIS affords is the ability to look at different layers of a map, right? So you can look at different um, expressions of politics, whether it's, you know, sort of electoral returns or if it's just the landscape of where people were connected. So it really allows you to look at different sort of reflections of the political landscape in relationship to one another that might not be sort of immediately you know, sort of conceived in your mind, right, about where these people are and what those, those networks mean. Um, but one of the things that I discovered by mapping is that, you know, Mahone only knew a small segment of what Black people knew about their communities already. So he's, you know, sort of grasping at what was already there, um, grasping at what Black people already knew. So that's some of what sort of emerges. Um, the other thing that emerges from looking at the maps uh, has to do with the sort of the, the depth of the different connections within the sort of political landscape. So I can see where, you know, the state convention of the Baptist convention, uh, sorry, the state convention, the Virginia Baptist State Convention doesn't necessarily map as easily onto the, re the readjuster movement support as some of the regional associations do. So that's one of the other things that I looked at was like, so what is the relationship between the Virginia Baptist State Convention and some of these regional associations where the, you know, sort of the um, support is strongest um, and sort of seeing how even in these even smaller communities, they grapple with um, politics in a very, uh, in a much more um, sort of direct and rich way. Um, so that's some of what I'm able to see by mapping is, you know, how, what Mahone saw and didn't see, what the black churches and their communities did in sort of more segmented pieces. Um, but then the other thing that sort of really emerged for me by looking at the maps was the network. Um, you know, I had come across letters um, in the archive of people writing to Mahone in support of their political candidates and making claims on the basis of their geography, which was not, you know, not like all the other letters in the archive that I read. They were not like, you know, my husband was a supporter of the readjusters or, you know, I, my son and my husband are sick and I need support. It wasn't those kind of letters. It was, you know, we are supporting this person because they supported our church community and we are reflective of our communities. And when they sign, they're signing from many different counties, you know, not just any one particular location. So I was like, this is really a reflection of a sense of political connection that for me sort of mapped well and to use the word mapping mapped well with the kind of the, the geographic political engagement that was being fostered in the conventions and so you can start to see how these sort of larger landscapes of belonging uh, are you know sort of influencing the political claims making that people engaged in um, because of the maps and I don't know that I would I wouldn't have necessarily seen that um, literally seen with my eyes that um, that argument had I not mapped it just a follow up on that. Um, thank you. It, uh, one question that came in in advance was uh, kind of the opposite. What it, it asked, you know, what are the downsides or the kind of critiques of digital mapping? What did you, um, what, what there, were there things that you hoped to be able to do that you weren't able to do or limitations in the technology? Um, you know, tell us a little bit about some of the kind of trial and error ups and downs of your experience with that. Uh, so, um, the mapping technology, um, I think it required 
me to do a lot of thinking about what it is that I hoped to be able to understand about the landscape using mapping. And that took me into a lot of the discourse around Black digital humanities and about the politics of mapping to understand how maps have been used to, um, to deny Black people rights, how maps have been used to um, sort of reflect and to perpetuate inequality uh, for Black people. Um, and so it was really important for me as I was kind of engaging in using this technology to think about how what I was doing was speaking back to those power dynamics and trying to um, push back against those um, marginalizing, marginalizing and frankly violent practices that maps have been used for. And so for me, literally representing Black people on the map was significant and powerful and important to do. Using the archive of Black life as the source to reflect Black life was really important. Um, and so it was really, you know, trying to create a way of visualizing where Black people were um, that, that motivated me. Now, there are definitely limitations in the way that I was able to reflect that. Um, and so, you know, which is why the Fulcrum Project was helpful in ways. I was really glad um, to have the opportunity presented by my editor, Elaine Maisner at UNC, to actually do something like the Fulcrum Project, which allowed me to have this um, third version of the book that um, allows me to have a map that actually moves. Because once you start trying to lay layers on top of layers on top of layers, it just becomes kind of messy and it's hard to see. Um, but working through Fulcrum allowed me in conjunction with um, the uh, Jeff Everhart and Tom Woodward and, um, and Aaron White and Todd Easter, folks at VCU where I was as I was finishing up the project to come up with ways to create a moving map, right? One that you can sort of toggle on different layers and see the relationship. Um, so there are ways in which trying to reflect even using Black people's experience and lives, reflecting them on the map, you still need ways to make the maps movable and make them interactive in ways that really um, sort of push back against creating a map that is static, that shows you a reflection of reality and the truth, right? Um, you, it really has to be something more dynamic. And so I think that's one of the limitations, uh, one of the limitations that you face in digital humanities, but also that can be overcome. And I think there are you know, more and more strategies to kind of push back against those, those limitations. But that's one of the ones I came up against was I need something more than a static map. That's great. We should give you, we should first, uh, before we uh, start pulling some questions, with some other questions, which we'll do, and please keep submitting, um, give you a moment to talk about, if you're, if you're up for it, the mappingblackreligion.com about your, uh, you, you gestured to this in your, in your question, but to make keep, sure people kind of know what's there and also uh, what might be forthcoming uh, with that, that might, you know, you tell us, go beyond your book or, or show, you know, uh, you, know t you, you tell us what to expect to see there. Sure, thanks. So, you know, it's interesting because I started the Mapping Black Religion Project um, in conjunction with the, the manuscript, because I was trying to find a way to do that kind of um, moving that I talk about that ultimately became possible through the full conversion of the book. Um, and so, uh, so I, I often think if I, um, if I had known about Fulcrum at the start of the manuscript or as I was starting to revise the manuscript even, you know, how might I have approached having this uh, digital site differently? Uh, and, you know, Fulcrum allows a lot of what, you know, I think I Im imagined this website would do, um, but it's not fully realized even in the book yet, I'll say that. So I still have the Mapping Black Religion um, website, which, you know, sort of reflects more of the engagement with the digital humanities and how it is I'm trying to use the archive of Black life to interrogate mapping and mapping practices. Um, right now, you'll find some of the similar narrative of the transformation and more maps that reflect some of the changing landscape of Black churches, uh, some of the changing landscape of the political transformations that happened during this time. And that for me was like the first stage of the project. The second stage is, um, as I'm sort of working through trying to get it, uh, get it, get it done, has to do with making a more interactive site, um, one that would allow users to do more of the kinds of things that I did um, by creating maps based on the different facets of Black community. So maybe there are other questions that you can ask based on the archive of uh, churches and, and associations that I've gathered. And so basically, it'll take you know 
uh, suck in all of the you know data that I've sort of transcribed and allow users to be in, to interact with that information and come up with new questions and new insights about the relationship between politics and religion. Um, I think it will also allow because you know we started to sort of build in more information about some of the communities, uh, some of the churches, some of the individuals to allow more uh, visualization of the networks of people who were involved and engaged in the convention. So really pushing further that um, the insight about connection about networks that the the manuscript raises. Um, hopefully, people will be able to see even deeper connections than the ones that I saw. That's great. Thanks so much. The, the, we're pulling from questions that have been submitted. I'm going to pull two together that both ask about gender and race. Um, one specifically, but you know, I'll, I'll, I'll try and pose them each, but also uh, lay out what connects them. I think that they're both each asking in, in somewhat different ways about how the gender dynamics of a post-emancipation world were shaped by either direct power of uh, white people and their gender dynamics or about engagement in institutions where that could be transmitted. So one asked specifically how much the assertion of male domination was structured um, by participation in an Episcopalian church. Um, and the other asks about uh, on the sort of broader question of gender and sexuality and the imposition of, of norms about the role of Freedmen's Bureau agents in uh, attempting to impose a set of conventions uh, upon people uh, tied to their free labor vision and asking to what degree are ministers and other uh, people asserting power in the churches you study influenced by these kind of admonishments in this case coming from from northerners and uh, you know sort of basically how to think about the interaction between those goals and the rise of the kind of uh, politics of respectability and gender roles and ministerial power that you trace on the ground. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so when I think about the uh, cases in, in Guilfield uh, Church, um, the way that the church sort of arrives at the practice of excluding women from, sorry, excluding men from being held accountable for uh, unwed pregnancy, um, I've connected it to the landscape of politics and respectability and trying to sort of create a space for black men in, political, in the political landscape that would sort of be respectable and those kinds of things. But also, there's also an element in which the church is, at least the, from the, the minister or the, the, the pastor's direction, trying to sort of live out their vision of what it means to be Christian community. And part of that vision of Christian community has a set of practices around sort of dealing with conflict uh, and, you know, sort of dealing with conflict in community and trying to keep sort of the community together through the process of engaging conflict and to, in a way that doesn't sort of exacerbate the conflict but minimizes it. And so, you know, I think that that's some of what's influencing the gender dynamic there is that they're trying, by the direction of the minister, they're trying to sort of tamp down the conflict in the community, um, which, you know, dovetails with the politics respectability. It dovetails with uh, some of the you know, claims of the, of the Freedmen's Bureau around trying to shape black family lives and these sort of paternalistic models um, of sort of having men at the helm and sort of the ones through which sort of rights are being, um, are being um, sort of, you know, uh, dispersed or, 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 or um, are being uh, expressed. Um, and so some of what happens is both an attempt to create community and, and maintain community, but at the same time as being sort of um, undergirded and supportive of a set of dynamics that, um, you know, sort of marginalize women vis-a-vis -vis the sort of Freedmen Bureau practices. Um, and so, you know, I, I think this sort of points to me to think about how it is that, you know, thinking about decision-making practices in any community needs to be sort of more robust to think about the ways that it's both serving the needs of the community, but also maybe having alternate other effects uh, that maybe were not intended. Um, and then you, you asked the question also in relationship to the Episcopal Church and whether or not there are ways that um, sort of being affiliated with white churches is also shaping gender dynamics and gender roles. And I think that, you know, Yes, to an extent that even like the, um, the, the uh, discipline meetings of the Baptist churches are not just something that ba Black Baptist churches do, Baptist churches do them, White Baptist churches do them, and they did them in the antebellum period, and they focus on issues of sexuality there too, right? So there are ways in which uh, some of the practices dovetail, but they have a particular um, 
sort of context and valence for the community that's using it, using them in that particular moment. So they're not just taking it from sort of white people and implementing it, um, but they are you know, working out of their own context to make something meaningful and useful for them in that moment. Just to uh, follow up another question that somebody typed in has to do with your use of the term epistemology of community. Um, and just to add my own little editorial comment on that, I mean, the, the idea of community or black community, community formation is obviously so important in African American history. And so, you know, um, I see, I would imagine that when you're, when you're using the term epistemology of community, you're sort of trying to bring forward an interpretation um, of what community construction means, of how it's done. Um, but I'd like to hear you, and this question asker would like to hear you talk more about um, your use of that term, um, kind of what's at stake in using the term, and what it might suggest, uh, I'm reading here now, about political practice in a period of volatility, that is, you know, a period when gains can be made but also lost really easily. So what does it mean to talk about an epistemology of community? Yeah, and I and also I would add, I would add to that question and sort of think about it in, a, in our contemporary moment too about like how, how communities are changing uh, and what that means. But you know, so so epistemology of community was my way of calling out what it was that I observed in the records and what they were ultimately able to do with what they had in the records. Um, and so it was a, about knowing, right? Part of what. Um, what is at stake for the conventions, the Baptist conventions, as they are gathering their uh, names of churches and ministers and locations is about knowing who they are. And that has, you know, um, a particular significance as Baptist people um, in, in a landscape of religious possibilities uh, and in a landscape where, particularly in Reconstruction in this moment, you know, Black people can choose anywhere to, to worship, right? So it's important for them to know who are a Baptist and how that community is growing. Um, and so I really, again, was just trying to call attention to that as a practice. Like, you know, otherwise you could easily look at those lists and think it's just a list, right? Um, but there's this actually a practice. So I was trying to call attention to that. Um, and I think, you know, yes, it's in a moment of volatility as things were changing, um, but it's also dynamic, right? Because they are keeping these lists across time. So as their conventions are growing, they are documenting that transformation. Um, and, you know, I think it, but, you know, it obviously has limitations. It doesn't go to the, you know, the, the nitty gritty of the idea, right? The ideas of politics and what it is that any particular individual or group of individuals were pursuing in an, any moment as the political landscape transformed, right? So it doesn't tell us, you know, whether or not uh, some of these people decided that they wanted to stay aligned with the readjusters as the readjuster movement was, you know, sort of pushing against black men and black men holding political office because that's who could hold office as they were pushing against black men rising to the level of, you know, running for Congress as John Mercer Langston did. It doesn't tell us that. Uh, and so, you know, I think there are obviously limits to that, you know, sort of knowing who belongs in that community or who's part of that community but it was definitely an important practice to call attention to, that that is what they were doing when they gathered their list. It had uh, a, a political impact and import. I mean, it's so, such uh, a creative way to think about institution building, really, and also using the sources that you do have available to kind of develop a story and a history, right? So it's a it's a really, you know, and I just to, you know, I think a lot of people who've done archival research, particularly in social history, history of African Americans, have seen lists and sort of wondered what to do with them or, you know, can they what can I use this for? Um, thinking about, you know, so what you're describing is using it to think about how institutions and connections and networks were created. Um, anyway, sorry, Greg, why don't you go ahead? The uh, another one thing you gestured to uh, in that answer and that a couple of the pre-submitted questions asked us to ask you to reflect upon um, is having written a, uh, you know, tremendous work of history. Now talk about the present, right? The, uh, <laughs> you know, to ask uh, about how you understand, um, you know, both the relationship of the, the topics that you study to the present um, and about the relationship of this engagement of, of religion, politics, and, and community formation 
um, to create political change, how you might understand that in a period uh, now, uh, and as the questioner asked specifically about how we might understand it in a period shaped by uh, the movement for black lives. Yeah, and so, you know, I would, I would come at it in a couple of ways. Um, first, I think for the current landscape, one of the things that I definitely had in mind uh, with this work was thinking about black church communities. I come from one, I came from one that was very politically engaged that, you know, for most of my life has been the muse from my work. I mean, it's really caused me to question these, uh, the relationship between religion and power and politics. Um, and to think about how black church communities engage politically and also about the ways that black church communities engage gender dynamics and gender uh, and how black church communities think about themselves as historical actors. And so part of what I hope the work suggests is that even in this particular political moment that um, black churches and, and black religious communities will think about themselves in historical moment, right? How is this, this what is this particular moment calling us to do? Right, um, black churches changed across time. They changed from the moment of slavery to the period of emancipation and throughout. So, what are black churches being called to do in this particular moment? I think there's been a lot of attention given to, and, and people all, sort of automatically assume that churches will be on, you know, engaged in particular ways. But I think that, you know, what this study I hope shows is that um, that churches actually responded to the moment, that they were engaged in the moment, and they were making political um, in uh, political in, in interventions um, of, of the moment that they were in. And so I would say that would be one of the first things. But then as you know, as we think about the movement for Black Lives, I mean, one of the things that is really clear um, for this moment uh, that I'm studying in Reconstruction, um, and that is really evident today, is that this whole discussion about Black Lives Matter, I always tell my students when I'm teaching that you know, when I'm teaching 19th century or the early part of the African American history survey or African American religious history um, or, you know, uh, religion and, and politics, that the argument that Black Lives Matter has been made, right, forever, right, from, from the first enslaved people being brought here to the present. And we can see it most powerfully in this moment that my book, is, my book covers uh, in the ways that Black churches and Black people are pushing for uh, the right to have soul liberty, right? To have the freedom to worship how they wish, to have equity, justice, and freedom. And the issue that comes up again and again, this is one of those questions from the historiography, the failures of Reconstruction. Why does Reconstruction fail? Not because Black people didn't make the argument for Black freedom and for Black lives, but because there was a lack of investment in the belief of Black freedom and the value of Black lives as Black lives, right, as lives. And so, you know, in this moment, if, if there's anything that we can sort of gain from this study is that Black Lives Matter is being made in this moment. And it's not just for Black people to make that argument, but it's for the larger society to really not just acknowledge it, but to deeply, like, accept that, right? Um, so that's one of the things I would say about the moment. Um, so Black church communities, you know, this is a particular, particular political moment to be engaged in, um, to be thoughtful about, to, I would also say, expand the critical analysis to an intersectional frame. So it's not just about Black people or Black men or Black women, or but it's really intersectional, thinking about how those uh, categories relate to one another. Uh, and then that, you know, Black Lives Matter is a fundamental concept that has to be embraced and it comes through in this study and so many more. Well, Dr. Turner, I think that's a perfect ending point where it's uh, one minute before the hour. And, uh, you know, I think that was a beautiful way of kind of bringing your work on, Recon on the Reconstruction period forward to the present in ways that are, make us think and uh, are really provocative. Um, and before we go, I just want to thank our participants who are here. I want to thank you again for being with us. I want to also thank Cecily Zander and Matt Isham, who have been kind of in the background here doing so much to help us get set up. And uh, Matt is the managing editor of the journal and works at Penn State, and Cecily is a PhD candidate at uh, Penn State University. So thanks so much to both of you for making this happen. And Nicole, thanks again. Thanks for this wonderful work and, uh, you know, hope we can continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you all so very much. This was uh... A, a pleasure. Thank you.
Uh, the pleasure was all ours. We really appreciate it. And uh, we hope that many of you uh, listening and watching today will be able to come to, to one of our upcoming talks. Uh, next one again is Wednesday, August 5th, same time with Dr. Tira Hunter on emancipation during the Civil War. Uh, but you've said a lot for people to live up to, Nicole. So no. uh, <laughs> the, uh, it's really been terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.